Well, hello everyone and welcome to episode 54 of the Yorkshire Gamer Elite Big War Games podcast. And today we've got one of our hybrid episodes where we have an historian on who's also a bit of a war gamer as well. And we're going to be talking to Nigel Atter and we're going to be chatting about World War One in Mesopotamia, which is one of the forgotten fronts of World War One, but one of my big favourites when it comes to wargaming. So we'll be heading over there very shortly. If you do happen to notice a bit of a change in my voice at the moment, I've got a bit of a chest infection, so that's why I might sound a little bit Barry White or a little bit Chris Rea, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but um, I'm not losing my voice or anything, I've just got a bit of a chest infection. So if you are on the Yorkshire Gamers Elite Big War Games group on Facebook, you might have known that I had a little bit of a, a bit of a rant last week. Um I generally in the past have booked my guests in maybe five, six at a time, and everything has usually gone fine. Occasionally I would have a problem with one guest and we might have to put off every now and again. Um, but we got there in the end. But this time, um, I have kind of been stuck in like a never-ending circle with a number of guests, and I've not been able to get them on, and we've been putting off, etc. And it's kind of got me into a bit of a tiz, and I've kind of not been putting out the episodes that I've wanted to. So um, I've had to have a bit of a think and a bit of a sea change about how I'm going to do things. So I have a new policy in place, and that is that rather than booking guests months in advance, uh, which got me into trouble, uh, I'm going to have no more than two guests in the cl- in the queue. So I'm going to have one guest who is ready to record and booked in, and then one on warning for the next episode. And anybody else, I am just going to say to them, sometime in the future i just i'm not going to commit to this sort of six to seven months ahead um because it's it's just got too much for me and i've started to you know want to not want to stop doing the podcast but it, it's put me off putting episodes out and you know you go around five or six people and you don't get an answer and you just give up and then you wait another couple of weeks before you you build up the enthusiasm to get some guests on, and then you go through the same cycle again. So once I've done that, on, I've got through these, you know, I'm doing two guests at a time, and if I can't organise something within a month, then that guest uh, is going to go back into the pot of future potential guests, and I'm going to get uh, a replacement. Now, it sounds a bit ruthless, but I've tried to make everybody happy in the past, and it, and it just hasn't worked. And I've got over 50 people on the list. I keep adding more to it. Um, after my little rant on Facebook about another 10 people came forward, which is lovely, um, but guests haven't been my issue. It's organising people um, that is the problem. So, as you know, I do 15, 20 episodes a year, and included in that are two brews in the vineyard. So, if you're on that list, it could be years before I get around to uh, sending you an email. Um, and I just want to make people aware out there, if I have spoke to them, I'm not being rude by not contacting you. I'm really grateful that people want to come on the show and be part of it. But I just have to have a system that's better for me so I can um, manage it and keep enjoying it. So the next two shows are booked after this one. And... Um, I just want to say that the, the podcasting is a rewarding, personally, not financially, experience, um, but it's quite a solitary thing. So you organise it, you briefly meet the guest, then you spend hours editing and compiling before releasing a show to the world. Um, and it's great to see numbers go up slowly over the three years plus that I've been doing this. Um, and it's nice when people just you know leave a message, leave a comment, subscribe you can tell that it's going somewhere and you know i'm getting up to three and a half thousand downloads per episode now which is just amazing and the dave brown one's nearly over four thousand which is just absolutely absolutely amazing um when i get to shows and things like that that's when i actually get to talk to people about 
what I'm doing and and get like a physical response to it. And it's it's overwhelmingly positive. And sometimes some of the responses I get, especially some of the responses I had on Facebook, were were quite moving. Uh, you know, people who you know maybe don't get out too much. Um, maybe the the poorly. They they have a sense of belonging and just listening to people talking about the hobby makes them feel better. And it was lovely to hear from those people uh, on Facebook last week. So this daft bloke living in Pudsey talking about toy soldiers isn't going anywhere. He's just kind of changing the way that he books his guests going forward. So apologies for the long introduction. I just wanted to make that clear to everyone. And um, I've known Nigel for a while, and um, he came forward uh, as one of the people who suggested, oh, I'll come on, Ken, and we'll just talk about something. And I contacted him, we'd organised it and recorded it within a week, and that is what I want from now on. Uh, so uh, that's how it's going to be going forward. So it's time for you to get yourself a cup of tea, and a Yorkshire tea, obviously, uh, maybe some biscuits uh, and get yourself nice and comfortable. If you're going to do a bit of painting, um, throw your wet palette out the window and get an old bit of MDF. So, without further ado, here's an interview. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to episode 54 of the Yorkshire Gamers Elite Big War Games podcast. And today, my guest is a is a historian and a bit of a war gamer as well. And he's published uh, a couple of books on different theatres of World War One. And uh, we've got With Valor and Distinction, which covers the Second Battalion of the Leicester Regiment during during uh, the whole of the First World War. And we'll talk a, a bit of detail about that later on. And he's also um, testing my French pronunciation with In the Shadow of Bois Hugo. I mean, that was quite good. Um, so, <laughs> which looks at the 8th Lincolnshire in the Battle of Lewes. Uh, later in the show, we're going to talk, take a deep dive into World War One Mesopotamia campaign, which regular listeners and all know is a favourite of mine. It's an oft forgotten theatre of World War One. Um, I would consider myself as a reasonable student of history, uh, for an engineer that is, um, but it wasn't until I discovered that my great uncle Samuel is buried in Bagda Baghdad Cemetery and I kind of went, how the bloody hell did he end up there? So uh, that's uh, of great interest to me now and uh, we're going to talk in some detail later on about that particular campaign. But uh, let's not muck about, let's get our guest on board, so let's give a warm welcome to Nigel Atta. Hello Nigel. Hello, Ken. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to uh, to speak about my interests today. No worries. Welcome on board. Now, you've done a podcast before. I seem to remember that you were on Sean. I was. Uh, Sean Clark's podcast. Uh, I, I spoke about the Eighth Lincolns mostly on that podcast and yeah. a bit of wargaming as well. And um, I've done a couple of interviews with the Western Front Association following the publication of both of my books uh, as well. So there's a, there's a bit of me out there in the cloud somewhere. Yeah, and you've done um, you've done quite a few presentations and stuff, haven't you, with the Western Front Association and other, other uh, groups? I have. Um, so they range from 8th Lincolns and 2nd Battalion Leicestershire Regiment. I've done some work on the Indian Corps, both on the Western Front and elsewhere, um, on Kitchener, Secretary of State for War, and, and other bits and pieces that have taken my interest. Brilliant. Well, we, we've hopefully got the man who in the know for the rest of the show. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I'm not going to test you too hard because I, <laughs> I might look like I don't know anything. <laughs> um, so first thing we do, uh, Nigel, is the, is the four minute challenge. And that's just for you to give a, a quick potted history of your war game in life. And uh, I seem to remember from the bit you sent me, there's a few breaks here and there, but that could be quite an interesting topic to cover. Um, so if you're ready to go, I shall set my timer to four minutes. And um, the yeah. little klaxon doesn't work anymore, so I'll just be waving at you and pointing right, at okay. the thing uh, when, when it's near four minutes. So are you ready to go? I am. So right. war, war gaming, I suppose like most people of my age uh wargaming came to me when when i was a child stood at school 
yeah. with Airfix uh, miniatures mostly. Um, so I, I I buy those and and fight my own solo battles with them. Um, but a huge revelation to me was when one of my friends bought his First World War Germans along, and they were painted. I thought, oh my wow. god, that's <laughs> fantastic! Um, so that set me on a uh, on on a route to try and paint my stuff. I think I started off with my mum's nail varnish or something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I ended up sort of buying almost everything that um, Airfix had ever produced from ancient Britons and Romans all the way through to the lunar moon landing stuff. Um, was. Um, it, indeed. The Second World War was still really of interest to the general population, I think, during the 1970s, uh, you know, still within only 20 years since, since the war had finished. So I used to buy lots of magazines, uh, like little weekly magazines, to supplement mm. my reading around uh, the Second World War. And of course, with those amazing um, TV programmes, The World at War and Mark Arnold oh, Foster's yeah. Yeah. book that was published in 1973. I remember buying that. It was £3 for 300 pages. And I thought oh, it was oh. an absolute bargain. My mum's gone, you spent £3 on a book? But, um, <laughs> so of the FX, I absolutely loved the Napoleonics. Um, mm. I think, you know, just the colours of the uniforms there, uh, loved painting. I had the, the farm and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, but me and a couple of other lads on, on, on our street would have huge battles in somebody's back garden. You know, we'd take a, a massive box of stuff and uh, <laughs> develop our own rules and war, war gaming rules and, and fight that out. Um, another favourite for their fix is the uh, Royal Horse Artillery um, box set. So that that was that was absolutely fabulous. And then I suppose by the time I got to fourteen and fifteen, my interest, my head was turned, um, Ken, so, by, yeah. by women mostly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my my interest in uh, war gaming dwindled somewhat. But then it's been peaked in other periods. So. My airfix collection I sort of gave away to my cousin. Um, and then when I was in my early, early 20s, for some reason, but I can't, I, that, that was it. I, I uh, bumped into Lawrence from, from, from Partizan. He was doing like mm. a, you know, a showcase um, battle actually in the town where I lived. And that sort of spiked my interest. And so I built an English Civil War army, mm. uh, 15 millimeter. And uh, so all around heads, you know, foot, um cavalry artillery uh the same for um uh for both sides even had some uh some scots in there as well and, yeah. and then again I, as my interests move on i i gave that that army away and then for a long time it was a barren period of of, of not doing any war gaming or or modeling at all until my son was about six or seven years old and i don't know if you remember there was like a little weekly magazine where you could uh do lord, yes. the, lord of the rings yeah. And so I bought the first two issues and got like about 30 little orcs and, and then <laughs> uh, developed from that. And uh, uh, so he and I developed our own, well, I developed the system of wargaming um, for him. And, and we used to play um, in sort of Lord of the Rings type stuff. But competing with PlayStation or an Xbox was almost impossible. Yeah. And so they just went in the attic, although they have been out last year. And oh, I God. never thought I'd utter the immortal words, I've killed Aramagorn. Um, <laughs> uh, he was surrounded by too many uh, archers and uh, bit the dust. Um, oh, dear. But, um, but then during the pandemic, I, I, I fell into, you know, just searching around stuff and uh, I came across um, Storm of Steel's uh, account, so Alex's account, and yeah. started following him and others. And then I sort of um, whetted my appetite once again. And uh, I, 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 my wife is from Poland, so I have an interest in, in Polish uh, military history, particularly uh, the 1939 September campaign. So I bought a lot of um, bolt action miniatures when it was bolt action. Um, so those very early Polish and uh, early war German figures, I absolutely love those. So, I mean, Paul Hicks as a sculptor is absolutely magnificent. Yeah, amazing. I, I, amazing. He, he, he works wonders. And uh, so I've got those and I've uh, expanded 
those figures and um i've got war games rules now proper you know proper rules that you follow oh wow um, and um i joined uh, a, a couple of clubs uh, and uh, uh for personal circumstances means that i actually can't get to them at the moment but i have friends in the area where we have war gaming mostly using uh, dare i say it bolt action rules because uh, yeah. that's those are the rules that my uh, counterpart uh, is most familiar with but i've got the uh, i ain't been shot yet mormon uh, and o group uh, and stuff like that as yeah. well that at some point in time um i'll i'll, I'll get more into but uh, yeah the september 1939 campaign really interested for me there's a book called case white which is absolutely amazing written by a, an american um academic that's probably the best book on the 1939 campaign that one can read uh, so I've got the infantry, I've got those little TKS tanks, uh, artillery pieces, the TP-7, which wouldn't be unfamiliar um, on a British battlefield, actually. And then, of course, all the German early stuff from uh, mm. Panzer Ones, Panzer Twos, lots of armoured cars. And uh, I I've tried to keep it. I've tried not to go, whoosh. <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, I've got some sort of um, modern uh, infantry that's, in a box to be painted at some time uh, as yet undetermined. I've got, I've got a project on at the moment where I'm writing a book chapter on Douglas Haig at the Battle of Luce as ah. um, his performance as First Army Commander. So that's taking priority at the moment. But mm. uh, I shall be wargaming this Saturday, actually, Ken. Um, yeah. we, we're going to play um, um, a scenario uh, set in Poland where the Poles are defending uh, a village and the Germans attack it and have to get past them, um, yeah. advanced through. So that's a mix. The, the, the Poles have got a, a 37 millimeter Bofors anti tank gun, which Ooh. will sort out any early German yes, uh, armor. Um, but they're bereft of, of machine guns, really. So part of the German forces, there are five motorcycles with MG 40, 34s on them. Which is quite tasty firepower, actually. Yeah, it is. So it yeah, is. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to that. So I don't know how I've done. I'm probably not, I no. You you you're well over. You're well oh, over. Oh, am don't I? Worry. You were you were you were doing all right, but I just <laughs> let you let you keep going. Uh, <laughs> do you remember then? Um, we talked about toy soldiers and, and war gaming during that that um, extended four minutes. Um, how do you remember how you got interested in history? Yes. I mean, I suppose I've always been interested in, in history, but as I say, in the 1970s, there was that whole series of weekly or bi-weekly magazines and, and books about the Second World War. Mark Arnold Foster's book about you know, the world at war, the, the TV series, you know, there, regularly there were Second World War films, you know, shown on television. My, my father was too young uh, to have fought in the Second World War. And my grandfather uh, was colorblind, so he was an ambulance driver, an ARP warden um, mm. in the Second World War. But he would tell me stories about where well, I was born in Grantham. That was heavily bombed during the Second World yes, War. Yeah. Indeed, my mum almost lost her life uh, when she was about five or six years old. The Germans bombed the town and uh, the house before and the house after took direct hits. And wow. the bomb that fell would have fell, fallen on my mum's house, fell in the garden and destroyed my dad, my granddad's coal house. Not, yeah. not a nugget left, apparently, he said. Oh, right. Um, OK. <laughs> but after that, my my mum and her sister, my grandmother and great grandmother were all evacuated down to Northampton. But so there was another incident where my mum was almost killed, where she was strafed by German, probably Messerschmitt, 110 or or a hind called 111 or something like that mm. and uh my uncle was walking her home from school and uh the, the plane came down and opened fire on them and he threw her into an alleyway in a terraced housing mm. and at the time he was smoking a cigarette and the hot end from the cigarette fell into the onto her throat and she oh. bore that scar from wow. being five years old until until she passed away so that's partly because the Second World War was all around us in the in the nineteen seventies. That, that, that whetted my my appetite, and um, it, when we studied history at school, it was a we, we could do a Second World War project. So I did a, a project for my 
CSE on the Eastern Front. So I wrote to the, the Russian embassy in London and asked them if Ooh, they got <laughs> any, any material. And it was like, oh, the great patriotic war. And, and you know, the Russians were absolutely amazing and, and, and won the war completely. And yeah. Uh, uh, they're not, so anyway, you took that with a bit of a pinch of salt, but, but, that's, but that's how it all started for me. They've probably still got a file on you somewhere. They'll be going through the archives in East Germany and there'll be a Atta N. Yes, and Atta potential, question. Ten, potential communist. Like <laughs> <laughs> you, you never know in those days, do you? Everything no. was everything no. was recorded. It was a, yeah. it was a very different time, though, wasn't it? I remember, yeah. you know, growing up in the seventies, and and um, one of my grandfathers um, was uh, on the railways and and had a protected job, uh, and the other one went out to the desert. And uh, as he said, I fought the Italians, um, and then I got a job in Aden pumping oil because the bloody Germans turned up and they were too good. So. Yeah. <laughs> Another. Um key moment for me about history uh, that must have been in 19 so 2000 2005 ancestry gave a free trial uh, to people yeah. and um, my parents had put a little because my great grandfather fought with the eighth lincolns or the lincolnshire regiment during the first world war and my mum had my mum and dad had put like a little postcard and said you know his name and so on and so forth mm. so ancestry had given this free trial and I just typed in my great grandfather's name, and then it said like eighteen results. And then, what do you mean eighteen results? <laughs> and in, in those days, you know, when you had like modems that worked at about three bits yeah. per second, it, like the, the PDF <laughs> would go down, down the page. And at the first page that I saw, it said next of kin, and there was my great grandmother's name, my great wow. aunt's name, and you know, so all, all, mm. all of his close family. Because when he went to war, he left behind his wife and three young, young daughters. And so downloading all of that was was the start for me about my super interest in, in the First World War. So following that, I quickly joined online forums such as the Great War Forum. Um, I joined the Western Front Association. And in fact, I was uh, I jointly um, set up the Leicester and Rutland Western Front Association branch. Um, oh, wow. Which meets in Leicester well, with with um, a, a, another colleague, but it it was that moment that set all of this off, really. And um, and then going moving on from that, I um, I went to Birmingham University, and uh, I studied the first year of the MA in British First World War Studies. Mm. And uh, I remember Professor Gary Sheffield, who mm. I admire. Threw out a question into in, in amongst the students today, you know, about a research question, and I sort of knew that twenty first division hadn't done very well, but I didn't really know very much about it. I hadn't read very much about it, so I sort of shot my hand up and said, uh, "Discuss the military effectiveness of the twenty first division at the Battle of Loos." And as quick as a flash, <laughs> but with all the authority of a professor of military history, he just turned around and said, they bolted. And like, it was, a, <laughs> it was like somebody had hit me by lightning. It's like, well, yeah. but my, my great grandfather was in that lot. What are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, I remember going to speak to him afterwards, after, uh, after the session. It was a, like Saturday school. Yeah. And, you know, my great grandfather was in that unit. Um, and uh, so that, 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 that set me on a course of, you know, reading everything I could get my hands on about Twenty First mm. Division and Eighth Lincolns, and going into the archives and and uh, downloading the war diaries. And a part of my reason for my book on the Eighth Lincolns was to try and set the record straight. But almost all academic military historians would say that you know Twenty First Division bolted, and that they were part of a general reserve, which also included. 24th division and uh, but it's not as simple as that of course no no it never is it's absolutely true that some men retired but then they mm. were rallied and advanced again mm. but there was a there was a small section of the uh, eighth lincolns that actually stuck to it so they were being fired on en uh, enfilade fire both their flanks were in the air so to speak so there was they had no supporting troops on either side of them but they were in these trenches, which were like no more than two feet deep. 
but they stuck it out until like 6 p.m. in the evening and they were taken prisoner of war simply because every single man was wounded and they'd run out of ammunition. They just couldn't fight anymore. So it's it's not as simple as they ran away. It's actually much more complex. And, And indeed, I mean, on the very battlefield in which the general reserves are supposed to have fled, a man won a Victoria Cross, a guy from the Suffolk's regiment. Wow. Um, yeah. He had half of one of his legs blown off, but still attended to his Lewis gun and held the Germans up using his Lewis gun, even though he must have been bleeding profusely. I mean, he survived that battle uh, wow. and came back to the UK with half of his right leg missing. I mean, incredible bravery there. Mm. Um, I mean, the, the, the Battle of Lucid, you know, uh, one of those battles, not really, there's not a lot of work done on it. The best book is by Professor Nick Lloyd, big admirer of, uh, of Nick's work. Um, and you need to get there to, to see the battlefield. It's absolutely as flat as the palm of a person's hand. But at the time, there'd be winding gear, pit heads, little miners' cottages, um, so it was really a very difficult um, situation. The um, the reserves were held up by very poor traffic control, and it took them probably 12 hours to march six miles or something. And by yeah. that time, the Germans had gained the initiative, and uh, they'd got an extra 22 battalions of infantry in their second uh, line position. Um, their artillery um, was very active and being brought up. And uh, the second line was completely untouched. So the wire was intact. So you were asking these, and by the way, they were totally inexperienced. They'd never even been in trenches before. They'd taken them from the United Kingdom, from Britain, uh, mid, mid, mid-September, and they went into action on the, on the 26th of September. The Germans got their retaliation in first. We had our asses handed back to us on a plate, really. It, 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 it was a disaster. And uh, so my, my little volume on, on the 8th Lincolns, I think, gives a little bit of a, an insight into, you know, what went wrong and, uh, and, and why. Um, but that must have been an absolute traumatic baptism of fire for, for those men, including my great-grandfather. And yet, when they were next in action on the first day of the Somme, they did well. So it's mm. probably, it was a matter of training, um, no doubt, and also a matter of leadership. So when they arrived on the battlefield at, at Luce, they had no guides, no maps. They'd been deprived of food and water. Um, they'd been on the feet for twenty-four hours. You know, no wonder, no wonder mm. they didn't do very well. Yeah, it's um, it, it, it's a, a sort of set of circumstances that you would struggle to imagine how you would deal with yourself. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we, 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 uh, you know, we're all sat at home in our centrally heated houses, and uh, um, it's easy to criticise, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, yeah. Where, you know, it, if you've been in uh, lying in a trench in the, in the wet or in poor conditions for a couple of days, yeah. um, the way that you react to things uh, is, is is very different. So you, you've got that interest in history, and we've kind of talked about the the uh, the loose book. What's the bridge between those two things then? What was the thing that got Nigel Atta, historian, interested, family history, into author Nigel? Um, so attending um, Western, Front of, Western Front Association conferences and the Great War Forum conferences, Helion books were, were there mm. selling, selling mm. their work. And I got into conversation with the managing director about an idea that I had for a book uh, around the Eighth Lincolns. And uh, I remember saying to, to Duncan, uh, Duncan Rogers, that I don't, it might not come to any more than 15,000 words, which is just a little bit bigger than uh, an MA dissertation. And he said, well, if, you know, we'll publish it. You know, so I had to submit a, submit a proposal. In actual fact, in the end, it came to about 40,000 words. But so that, that, that meeting, meeting Duncan and meeting colleagues from the Helion books was the key thing for me to get published. And, uh, you know, one of the amazing things about Helion is that they, they take on new authors that had never been published before. And what they were looking at was the idea. What do you want to talk about? Is there something interesting there? 
and uh, they gave me the opportunity to, to do that and i'll be forever grateful to duncan and to, to helion and co um, for that opportunity i think helion uh, have done wonders for not not only military history wargaming research um a, a quite a wide range of things because they you know, I've I've had Nick Schofield on the show before, who wrote a, a book on the Papal Zouaves and the St Patrick's Battalion. Interesting stuff to me, but you know, not to the vast audience. So we, mm. we kind of, like you say, have to give praise to Hellion for uh, giving a space for these books to be published. And clearly, you know, they're a business; they need to make money, but they're not picking the you know the, how many books do we need on the ss in normandy uh, you know, mm. those sorts of things I, it was great to see you know obviously yourself getting um, books published on as you say battle of Lou's not particularly covered and then later on in the show we'll talk about mesopotamia another area that's not particularly mm. well covered um so big shout out to to hellion for that um, absolutely yeah, excellent um so do you are you interested in gaming world war one um i know we've we, we've we've talked a little bit about 1939 world war two but is is world war one of interest it is however mm. <laughs> mm. um what i'm trying to do is is const constrain what i got um, right because i have absolutely no space in the house yeah. for anything else yeah. i am green with jealousy and envy over your first world war mesopotamian <laughs> uh, armies which i've seen you know photographs of and, uh, and video mm. clips of uh, on youtube and i would love to fight that 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 campaign but uh, I, I, I'm trying to be very, very disciplined in just mm. keeping, you know, September 1939 campaign uh, uh, as much as I can. Um, mm. I mean, I have expanded into the late war for uh, for German forces and also for uh, I've got Soviets as well. So it's that Eastern Front side of things. First World War, I think that, uh, as you say, Mesopotamia, not very well understood um as a period of history during during the first world war mm. you know when you look at the historiography of all of the first world war there's huge amounts of material on the psalm and passchendaele on the western front but if you look at places like mesopotamia or east africa um or palestine mm. where some of the most famous victories the british ever uh, uh, ever achieved there's very very little work on that so yes but yes if i could so if you know, I, 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 you know, if, if, if there's a, a a convention where there's a participation game for a First World War Mesopotamia campaign, uh, Ken, I, I, I'd be there. I'd be there. No worries. Well, next time I run one of my big games because our next battle is the Battle of the Wadi. Oh um, right, okay. We're going through. We've started at Basra and we're going all the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so when I do that, I'll let you know. And that's going that's going to be on a little twenty-four foot table. Uh, <laughs> fantastic fairly yes. small that one yes uh, so i'll let you know and, and if you can make it you're more than welcome fantastic uh, thank along, you come along and join in so the we've talked a little bit about the 1939 campaign in poland and again that's that's another one that's a little bit less well known in in the uk we tend to concentrate i think um on the desert and um well d-day and the drive to uh berlin rather than that and obviously we live in britain we live in the uk so there's, there's always going to be that um sort of slant towards places where british soldiers are involved mm. um so you say you, you your wife's polish and that is that where mm. the interest for that it is yes come from yeah yeah i mean i've been to poland many 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 times and it's a country steeped in history mm. um so my wife's grandfather i was a junior polish civil servant he was taken off to Dachau in nine, you know, in the early part of the war, just because he was a civil servant. Yeah. And yeah. so he was away and arrived back in Poland in 1946. Um, mm. But he, one of his final jobs was the SS had like a work details where they would send uh, foreign workers into houses to bring out the German dead. And mm. they had the opportunity there to search for food because it was a very dangerous place to be and that's yeah. partly how he survived and then on the march back to uh to poland 
he fell very seriously ill and fell into a ditch and a, a German farmer found him and um, and uh, and saved his life. They took him back to their, their farmhouse mm. and, and brought him back to life. My my father-in-law here had a brother who was killed during the war. Uh, and they, they, I mean, their experiences of occupation by the Germans and, and also by the Soviets. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, it got worse after the war, didn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's um, it's a it is a it is a fascinating country, and um, I always, although I've got no personal responsibility at all, I'd like to add, um, but I I always feel slightly guilty um, for the way that we treated the Polish. Um, yeah certainly yeah. after the war yeah. and uh, i remember and i'm sure other people of my age will there were uh, a lot of polish servicemen association like working men's clubs uh, yes. around the uk there were you know guys who had left homeless effectively who were yeah. living in the uk and and met in these polish airmen's club etc um for solace and and sort of meeting fellow countrymen so yeah i i'm a little bit uncomfortable of what we did and yeah, we kind yeah. of left them to it when we promised them the world um so yeah it's uh it's a yeah something i might come back to on another show yeah. that is um bit too, bit too much to go into t t today but yes. um certainly worth looking at you've renewed your interest in in war gaming and i i met you very briefly at uh, parties and one year yeah. so um do you attend shows on a regular basis as many as i can uh so partisan and and hammerhead but being at newark are the the closest yeah. ones uh for me but I, i've been to salute so but i i do tend to be local uh ken rather than uh, I've been up to um, the one in uh, Sheffield as well. So yeah, yeah, you know, I, you know when when my son was younger, you know, we used to go together, um, mm. and he enjoyed that as much as I did, which was which yeah. was good. Um, but uh, yeah, mostly local uh, for me. We'll just finish off then with um, this introduction section with the with the Venn diagram of wargaming, and we've got I think we've got quite a good idea from from the chat that we've had, but we'll uh, we'll put it out there. So um, the the Venn diagram consists of wargamer, painter, collector, and historian. So um, how how do you put yourself into those different circles? Well, I think I'm a, I think I tick the box on all of them yeah um but historian first um and perhaps a painter second to, 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 in terms of priority prioritizing the time that i the free time that i ha, ha, have available it's definitely would be historian first because as i say i've got this this book chapter on douglas haig that i'm working on and uh, that's got to be finished by the end of the year and um, it, it's incredible, the amount of material. I mean, it's interesting writing about Haig because, you know, lots of very able and eminent historians have poured over Haig's yeah. papers. And yeah. what I'm trying to do is bring a, a different perspective, if there is mm. one. And I think there are things that um, the, 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 that's new. And uh, so uh, all that work is based primarily on the, on the well, on the primary sources, but also... Mm. I've read through secondary sources from you know, other academic historians uh, and see what they have to say. You know, people like you know Tim Travers uh, and Gary Sheffield and uh, and uh, Robin Pryor, for example. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Do you enjoy the process of painting? Um, oh yes. You know, I, I, I'm a I'm a big painter, as as most people who listen to me know. Yeah. And I enjoy the process. I I don't. I'm not rushing to get things on the table. I'm enjoying the painting. So how how do you take? You know how how do you approach painting? Is it a joy? It it, it definitely is. It's a joy and a pleasure, and it is so good for one's mental health. Yes, it's definitely. so good. For, I mean, I'm absolutely with Henry Hyde on this about mm. paint, sitting down and you've got a tiny figure in front of you and you're painting it. You're not trying to get paint on bits that you've already painted, you're trying to be very accurate. And when you're focusing on that, you're not thinking about anything else in the world. Mm. Um, well, I'm not anyway. <laughs> yeah. can't, can't do two <laughs> things at once. <laughs> no, no, um, very true. So, I mean, I try to be very accurate. I think that, you know, when I've posted some of my figures online using social media, I've had you know, sort of relatively positive feedback. 
um, on that. But no, I think painting is important. And then being mostly accurate is important as well. Um, so I've got those little Osprey books about, you know, what Polish uniforms, what colours they were, you know, and for Germans and Soviets and, and so on and so forth. And I think that that's helpful. But so you don't need, I don't think you need a huge palette. You know, I've probably got three or four flesh tones, but um, khaki is khaki and German field grey. Well, that is a myriad of colours. Yeah, um, that is. A, that's um, that's, but, that's a, uh, we don't want to go down that road. No. Is, <laughs> <laughs> but black boots are black boots. You know, they can be yeah. dusty, you know, yeah. buff coloured dusty or grey coloured dusty. I've been experimenting a lot with um, Agrat's Earthshade. Is that it? Oh, awesome. yeah. Oh, is, is that from Alex? Yes. So I think Alex bathes in that stuff. He's, he's got a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably like uses it as a hair dye. <laughs> yeah, some some people get the you know the big tankers that come along with um, fuel oil for the house. Um, <laughs> Alex gets one of them with Agrax Earthshade in. <laughs> I remember the first time I used it, and my fingers turned completely black, and I thought, "What's going on? <laughs> I've just spent hours painting these, and I've ruined them." So I just painted over the top of them. So, but so what I've been doing is experimenting with different dilution of Agrath's work, earth shade. So, fifty percent water, fifty percent stain, and or ten percent and ninety percent, depending on what I'm I'm uh, painting. Or sometimes I just get the brush and paint the Agrath's in the folds. You know, the deep folds of the uniform, yeah. and just pop it on there rather than lathering it all over all over the uniform. That that's the technique I use. I, right. I think it's, it's called pin washing. Yes. So you're you're just taking the like the edges of belts or something like that, just to add that extra level of depth to it. Um, so yeah, it can be, you know, covering the entire model in it. It sometimes destroys all the work that you've done. It's like mm. my point precisely, Ken. Um, <laughs> I mean, the other thing I do use it a little bit for armored fighting vehicles. So once I've got the mm. let's say the Panzer Grey down on it. I, I usually have the, the tracks and the, the bogies that are, you know, covered in mud or dust or something of mm. that order. Um, and uh, then I'll put a, a, a light Agrax wash on the top of it and then highlight with Panzer Grey and then put some um, white or another um, colour on to give it some, you know, sometimes just a, just white can be really helpful, you know, to, to pick up the highlights. At, um, I, I think Agrax works really well for those grills in the it, it, where the engine is. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's good and, use and for it. Just yeah. fill the grill up and then run yeah. run your thumb across it, um, yeah. so that the the grill is still can be seen. But yeah, I think it works yeah. like that. But painting is a real joy for me. I never get frustrated by that. Um, and as you say, it's not something to be rushed. It's something to be enjoyed. And I think yeah. the benefits of painting for good mental health are are really really out there i mean many many people on social media i've said you know if i'm if i'm stressed i can go away have half an hour an hour painting and and the world doesn't seem quite such a difficult place uh for a while yeah. at least it's something that you know I've, I've talked about quite a lot and i did the the mental health podcast with henry that mm. was uh, mm. you know that's quite important to me yeah. and um you know obviously those who know i've got a really stressful job so um it it's um it, it must be really stressful the amount of figures i get painted that's what that's my excuse <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> um so yeah it, it's really important to me and that focus that you can get with um everything is is just looking at that 28 mil figure or 15 mil figure or yeah. whatever scale it is um and the rest of the world just disappears so yeah, yeah. It, it's a fan, fantastic tool for people to uh, to zone out and I, and um i think um mostly down to henry bringing it out and into the general public I, and i was more than mm. happy to sit mm. on a show with him and um he said, "Oh, I think I think they'll find it better from a roughy tufty bloke who lives in Yorkshire than from <laughs> some southern softy down in Eastbourne." So it was good fun doing that show. I have no, to it say. was. I, I enjoyed but, listening to it. Yeah, but kudos to Henry for bringing it out and making it sort of an approachable mm. subject within the hobby. Um, yeah. So um, 
we're going to uh, have a slight change up to to normal now. Um, we're not going to do a, a big game section because we're going to concentrate on the history at the end. Uh, but we are going to have a little bit of a feature section. So we're going to put Nigel through the quiz and, and uh, oh. Desert Island War Games and all that. So we'll be back in a minute, ladies and gentlemen, with the features section. Welcome back, everyone, to the feature section. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, is put Nigel through our Wargamer quiz. Uh, 20 questions of complete irrelevance to anything. Um, but uh, you know the questions by now. They, they don't change. Although I might. I'm thinking of, put, I'm thinking of putting a, question, a different question in, but more of that in the future. Um, so... Uh, the the uh warning before we start I suppose some people get upset uh this is just a bit of a laugh and it's a yes or no answer there's massive massive regional bias in some of these questions um and, and i don't care so there we go <laughs> so uh, so are you ready to go nigel yes please e excellent um question one go big or go home go big go big excellent uh contrast paints are they great or are they a gimmick i don't know have you not tried them i've not tried them i've seen them and no troy has been using some some quick contrast paints but no i've not tried them i have to i should top tip to save you some money put some water in your ordinary paint <laughs> That's what I'll do anyway. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah. Anyway, not that I'm biased or anything. Uh, right, question three. Paintbrushes. Are we going posh and expensive Windsor and Newton or Yorkshire-made quality pro art? Pro art. Pro art. Good answer. Good answer. We've seen, can you tell any bias in that question? Um, well, I do know you interviewed the owner of Pro Art, and I listened to that. It was absolutely fascinating. Was it? Um, it was. It, was. I, it really I, was. I love doing that. Yeah. So, yeah. One of the things for me about this podcast is is I enjoy it. Um, yeah. And for years, and I mean years, I worked opposite Pro Art, uh, and I always used to like come out and go, "It's Pro Art. I use their brushes. I really should." <laughs> Go and have a chat with him. Lovely guy, Peter. Uh, lovely guy. Uh, and I see him quite a bit now reg uh, regularly. And we stop and have a chat. So, that, yeah, I yeah, really enjoyed excellent. that. That was a, a good one. Um, question four. 96 figures. Is that an army or a unit of pike? Uh, for me, it'd probably be uh, uh, an army, I think. Yeah. No worries. A six foot, six by four table. Would you say that's a big game or a small game? A small game. A small game. Excellent. Uh, question six. Uh, would you prefer a points-based army battle or an historic order of battle? Oh, definitely order of battle. Historical. So glad. glad. It seems to... Uh, there's a big divide, isn't there? Points and not points. Um, yeah. And it's a bit like Marmite. Uh, yeah. I, I just don't get points at all. Um, uh, I mean, it was... People it, who love it. Battles are not fought on a point system. I mean, you look at the Battle of Luce on the opening day, the British had seven times as many men attacking the German trenches as the Germans had in them. And, uh, uh, and that's a sort of a ratio you want if you want to, you know, capture the trenches and break through. It's not going to be 15 point, 1,500 points for you and 1,500 <laughs> points for me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Very true, very true. Um, so, mixing your paints, um, do you use a wet palette or an old bit of MDF? And, um, I actually use a, an artist's palette. Oh. Yes. Uh, and is it uh, ceramic or plastic or metal? It's plastic, yeah. It's yeah. plastic. Right. Give you half a point for that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not a wet, bloody palette. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, so, undercoating your figures, do you go black or white? I, I, I've tried a variation, so I've done ooh, ooh. black, yeah. and I like black because those bits underneath the armpits or in crevices yeah. and stuff like that gets covered. I've used white, and I didn't think that that worked as well for me, for my mm -hmm. figures. And I've also used like a, a light grey, which is halfway in between. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but at the moment I'm, I'm doing black, and rather than spraying them, I'm hand painting them. Oh, right, ooh, um, right, okay. Partly because when you spray them, you miss you miss bits. Yeah. But also, reverting back to the question earlier, 
it's about the joy of painting. So rather than just going and it's done, I actually take the care to undercoat them so that there's nothing missed. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I um, just slightly off topic. I, uh, my long serving uh, Badger Chrome airbrush died uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so I had to buy another, I bought another airbrush. I've got a Harder and Steinbeck Ultra. Um, really, really nice, really, really nice brush and uh, perfect for, they've designed it so it's easy to use. Um, so whereas the Badger Chrome was a bit of a specialist thing. Um, but I digress. Uh, so I was watching, uh, a YouTube video last night with this uh, Harder and Steenbeck, the, you know, the guys who run it saying, this is the brush and this is what we're doing. And there's this new thing. I don't know if you've heard of it. Zenithal um, uh, priming. No. Nope. So what you do is um, you prime it, you black. Yeah. And then you pick where your light source is and then you, you kind of spray uh, a light gray white down onto it and then paint over the top of that. And the guy must have spent like 20 minutes priming one figure. Wow. Uh, it's like, you're not going to get, you're not going to get a 96 figure pipe block done in, uh, in a year. <laughs> if you, if you're mucking about with that much of bloody, anyway, I've no. digressed, but I, no. I was swear, I was swearing and shouting at the telly. <laughs> like I do. This is, <laughs> I think this everybody is, does that. <laughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, the the YouTube rage had a bit of YouTube rage, um, but yeah, there's there's different ways of painting figures, and if you're painting one figure, that's the way to go. If you're painting like I do, big armies, uh, trying to get them to look nice, yeah, Zenithal highlights is not the way. Twice as long, twice as long at least. Anyway, I've digressed. Uh, so uh, hot hot drinks, Nigel, Yorkshire mm. tea or dirty mucky coffee? Coffee. Let me down. Let me down. Do you do, you do it? Do you do it properly with? Yes. With oh, that's sad. Yeah, you see, that's not too bad. Yeah. It's not like Nescafe Instant with that um, coffee mate. Do you remember Coffee Mate? Yes, I do. <laughs> oh, how dreadful was that? Oh <laughs> my God! And we we have a, a a little our when I make coffee, it's um, you've got the bottom part of it we you fill with water. And then the top part you pop on the top and in between there's like a little canister with coffee and what happens is it boils the water presses the steam through the coffee forces oh. it up into the pot in the top and then that's very nice to do it that way yeah you wouldn't put coffee mate in that would you no <laughs> no <laughs> no definitely if not. you don't know about coffee mate uh people um while you're listening, uh, I'd go and look it up. Uh, I'm sure they must have put some sugar or something in it because it, it got sweetener in it. Yeah, it's um, anyway, less of that. Yes, less of that. Let's talk about tea. Um, so, <laughs> um, war games units, it might not be relevant for you because you're more of a World War II man, but uh, uh, do you like your war games units tightly packed or socially distanced? Or I suppose historically accurate would be a better way of putting it. Historically accurate, yes. I mean, I love that, you know, the Napoleonics with column and line and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, I mean, I have played Napoleonics and uh, mm. Ancients and uh, um, American Civil War or Six Mil uh, with a friend. Mm. And yeah. uh, I just like the way that it, it aesthetically it looks really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's relevant and it should be stood shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. Your figures should be shoulder to shoulder as well. Absolutely. Not. I'm starting to get. I'm being very confessional today, Nigel. I don't know what. I, have you ever been? Ever thought of being a priest? Because you're getting loads of stuff out of me. I don't know what it is. <laughs> no. Um, no. <laughs> I'm starting to get. This is personal. I know people out there will use sabo bases and the big trays and stuff, but I'm starting to get a nervous twitch now when I see them. Um, and I've seen some lovely stuff recently, and they're just figures are just so far apart. You know, if they put their arms out, they wouldn't be able to touch each other. And I, I know, I know why people do it, but it's just a personal thing. Um, so if you see me at a show and you know, I've got like a little tick going, I've seen, <laughs> I've seen some huge stuff. Uh, Simon Miller brought it up a long time ago on this show. Um, and he hates it when the, the, they raise the figures up really, really high. 
because you've got your base and then you've got your sabo base underneath which which has got a level of thickness on um so that was his personal thing so yeah anyway so uh, to, right. just to jump ahead ken my my wall gaming 101 is actually basic because so when when i started off there weren't any bases you didn't get those little <laughs> plastic discs yeah and so i based all my figures on penny pieces and oh, I, yeah. I, was at a, I was at a club and this guy comes up to me who i was playing against says, your figures are not even on proper bases it's like <laughs> what what are you talking about this is a game <laughs> yeah but they're not on the discs i'm not you know i'm <clears throat> conservative when i'm spending my money so i'll do mm. I'll, i'd sooner put my figure on a penny rather than pay two quid for 20 shiny discs or whatever this is mm. Now that this is this is a um, we we have digressed massively here, but um, this is this um, <laughs> the, the, uh, this is an important question. This because I am um, you know people who know what I do for a living. I am a massive royalist, um, and I would much rather have a monarchy, absolute monarchy, than a parliamentary system. <laughs> um, and, and I think I, you know, I've been proved right over recent years. Um, so I will never glue a figure onto the monarch's head so you can tell it's one of my figures because the queen or the king um their head will face down towards the table but my friend dave who sadly passed away last august um was a, a bit of a lefty communist um you know um the country shall be run by committee one out all out <laughs> brothers those sort of thing. and he would always glue the figure to the queen's head as as dis so which way round are you nigel do you, do you, or don't you mind i i glue my figures onto the queen's head oh um, only because it appears to me to be a more stable platform if you see what it is. if you've got the port just, just, as, just as absolute monarchy is a more stable system of government <laughs> um, it's more stable <laughs> surface to glue my figure onto <laughs> oh excellent right we've had a civil war and i put my hand up we lo i put my hand up we lost but two years later you buggers on us back yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Poor, poor old cromwell all in bits and pieces after the doggy mob oh well shame shame yeah. bloody traitor anyway let's uh let's not go down that let's not reopen the wounds of the english civil war no not no, no. That, that another was... another podcast another one that will get me banned right so question 11 uh two hour club game or a weekend monster game oh weekend monster game oh fantastic two hours is too short yeah it, oh it is yeah definitely um you're in the middle of the, of the country so it could be interesting to see where you sit with this one um avocado are they just posh mushy peas i do like avocado oh nigel Avocado, smoked salmon, and scrambled eggs on oh, sourdough. Dear me, does that make you middle you, class? As you, well, it makes you middle of the country. Is your <laughs> is your family always lived in the middle of the country, or have you got no. southern relatives? Uh, we, I mean, uh, when Eva and I first met, we lived in London. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, you've been in. You've we been couldn't infected. afford avocados in those days. <laughs> 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 So, uh, the universal question, Nigel, don't let me down on this one. Everyone's answered the same so far. And that's round dice, spherical dice. Are they allowed or banned on your table? The work of the devil, absolutely the Work banned. of the devil, thank God. 54 episodes, we're doing well. Um, you're going down the chippy. Do you prefer haddock or cod? Haddock. Haddock. Excellent. Um now uh do you love a good table and a set of rules like a casualty table or do you prefer the the more simpler dice based rules of today i think jury's out for me on that i think simple rules that are easily and quickly learned are, are, are i think really helpful um stuff that you know you can keep in your head without having to refer to the rule book all the time um mm -hmm. but i do i do like you know things like um an opening barrage for example mm. it's not just about you know infantry coming to closing together into close combat i think yeah you know, when you look at the history of wars that you know there's usually an opening barrage i remember playing a game with um 
uh, with a guy and I suggested to him that we, you know, these were the opening barrage was in the rules. He, he just completely mm. flatly refused. <laughs> I'm not playing that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've sold I've sold my troops. I don't want any of them getting killed before we start. Yes. Bloody hell. Yeah. Yeah. Um question 16, 28 mil is king, yes or no? Yes, it is for me. Um 17, unpainted miniatures allowed on the table, yes or never. No? Never. Football in question. Um, although the way Bradford City are playing at the moment, it really isn't a football in question because we are utter sh- all right this year. <laughs> um, uh, so Bradford City or Leeds United? Leeds United. Oh dear me, dirty Leeds. Dirty. I, uh, They're doing quite well at the moment, though, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're top of the uh, mm. championship, top aren't they? Yeah. Uh, so see, I, I can't. I can't. I can't see that far up. <laughs> we're in the middle of, we're in the middle of, just in the middle we're in the lower middle of league two and we are playing dreadfully and yeah. um it, it does hurt me that leeds are doing really well and we're yeah. not but there we go <laughs> yeah I, I i was a student in leeds and um mm-hmm. so I, I love that city that uh and uh i i i'm old enough to obviously remember billy bremner and all the other greats from that that leeds side so um uh, used to love watching them um, yeah, they'd um, play football and then they'd do some all-in wrestling. Um, <laughs> and then, 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 then there'd be a fight um, and then a football match would break out. At, at <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was different, different, different times. Uh, uh, yeah, I think I think they would be down to six players in ten minutes. Uh, Definitely, with the current rules, yes. current rule. different, different, very different game in those days. Um, so question 19 is Yorkshire or the other place over the hill? Yorkshire. Good lad. Um, and then the final bit of controversy, uh, Games Workshop, are they the work of the devil as well as spherical dice? Well, I mean, it's very popular, isn't it? But it's never something yes. I'd play. I mean, my local club, I've, I've seen they've gone a bit mental on Games Workshop and there's all these weird and wonderful storm troopers. Stuff, yeah, something. yeah, Stormcast, I think they're called. Uh, I've no idea what it is because I, I want to yeah. you know, try and reenact or, or play something that happened in the past rather than mm. something that might never happen in the future. So, no, not for me. Excellent. Well, uh, a very respectable 70% there, Nigel. That's very, oh. very good indeed. Very good indeed. Um, we need to have a word about the coffee, obviously. <laughs> uh, that, needs to, well, that needs to get sorted out. Uh, but apart from that, oh, an avocado. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but other than that, you've done quite, you've done quite well. Um, so you, you mentioned in passing there your were War Games Room 101 um, basing uh, entry. So what is it about basing that drives you mad? I mean, to be told that, you know, your figures are based incorrectly. It's like, mm. what are you talking about? They're, they're, they're on a base. I mean, for, for my, um, for officers and uh, other, you know, sort of different troops, I would mm. put on, on a larger base. So it might be a mm. two, two penny piece. Um, uh, so, you know, definitely for officers uh, and maybe for specialist troops such as flamethrowers and stuff like that, just simply so I can more easily distinguish them on the table what, 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 when, when we're playing. But what, what I think basing does enhance a model or can enhance a model quite a lot. So, you know, the, the, all, the, all the tufts and stuff like that, you know, static grass and so on and so forth um, that you can get on a model. That's, I think sometimes you're passing in over into the realms of a, you know, a little display. But mm. I, I read once some uh, somewhere many many years ago, you just should paint each individual figure as if you are painting an icon, you know, a religious icon. And I, I've sort of that sort of stuck with me, and I, I've tried yeah. to do that, uh, perhaps poorly. But you know, I think a good basing with you know that, that's appropriate to the um to the t- table you're you're, you're uh, playing on um you know d- 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 does enhance um what mm. you see on the table mm. but it's that um 
insistence on specific sizing is that yes. the thing that's kind yeah. of yeah that, that 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 really I thought that you were having a laugh that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm I'm the same with that. I have always based my armies how I want them to look, and then yeah. changed the rules to fit how I've based everything. <laughs> yeah, because one of the one of the I think one of the most time consuming and pointless um parts of our hobby is rebasing figures yeah um uh, when it's when it's because you base them when you were 12 and you want to update them to 2024 fair enough but when you've rebased them four times because you can't make your mind up what rules you're going to play that mm. that's where i that's where i'm out i base them the based that's what we're playing with um and to be fair i think people who complain about the size of wargaming bases are, are normally not the sort of people I wargame with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an irrelevance, isn't it? Yeah, they're probably different things uh, going going on there, which which is good. Um, so we'll just we'll move on to Desert Island uh, war game then before we uh, we move on to our historical topic. So um, this is um, just like the the Radio Four show. You know, you're stuck on a desert island. Um, you've got to your religious book and i think you get the works of shakespeare as well um so what would be the one war game that you would take with you it can be any size of figures board game whatever you want to take oh right so um I, it for me it would be s s the polish september 1939 campaign so the many many scenarios there um but yes definitely uh, and because it's it's under researched it's not very well known um, lots of mythology about it. I mean, mm. was it Guderian saying, you know, cavalry attack tanks. They never did. It's yeah. just a sort of rubbish, even though he might have read, <laughs> written it as an autobiography. Definitely uh, September 1939 for me. Excellent. And um, a book. What would be the one book that you would want to take with you? Could I take a series of books rather than one book? Is that allowed? Oh, go on, then. Go on. So that would be I'll... the official history of the First World War. Uh, by Sir James Edmonds. Um, I think, you know, that, or if I had to absolutely choose just one book, it would be Nick Lloyd's The Battle of Loose. It's just called mm. Simply Loose, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that's a masterpiece. No. I, I've mentioned Nick's work before. It's very good. Um, he's a, a tremendous historian and somebody that, you know, I would try and emulate. So, yes, either the full set of the official history, which would be couple of trunks fulls of books or oh, are uh, they are they the uh yeah are they yeah right i think uh, yes yeah uh, i i i've i've inherited a large collection of very thick world war one books yes um, hang on a second i mean they are very good they are very good indeed yes Is, uh, the great war illustrated uh, no, that's not why I'm referring to actually. Yeah, no, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Oh, I've, right, I've got sorry, these. Yes. They're absolutely lovely. They are. Um, I mean, the, the 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 images in those are really very good as well. And loads that I'd, loads that I've not seen before as well. You would think that because they were in that book, they would be kind of cut and pasted into other stuff. Um, but yeah. they're a fascinating read. The the yeah. the Boeing the um, the eaves on my um loft at the moment because <laughs> uh, they, they, they are really really there's loads of them They're about come up to about my waist um but yeah no that's excellent so that's uh the book and then um is there a, a war games unit that you've coveted um i mean it could be one of your own it could be something else somebody something you've seen in a magazine what would be the the ultimate war games unit that you would take with you do you know I really do fancy the Polish winged hussars. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, I've been to the museum where you can see the uniforms. Mm. And, and, you know, the eagle feathers are, are on their back on this frame. And uh, I've seen them depicted in films as well. And uh, and as figures. But they, they, they look absolutely awesome. You know, they, they stand out so well on... You know, they would, well, I'd assume, they'd stand out so well on the table, given that mm. their uniforms are... You know, well, they're unique, aren't they? Those winged yeah. hussars, absolutely amazing. I think it's um, it's one of those things that, um, and I've had this with a couple of units where I've wanted that unit, but I've not really known that much about the history surrounding mm -hmm. them. And, and I know for a fact that if I bought a unit of them, 
I'd end up then with 2,000 figures for whatever yeah. uh, else was going on around <laughs> them. So uh, I've, I've done very well uh, to, to avoid them uh, at the moment. Well, thanks for taking part in, in the features section, Nigel. And we're going to move on now to our bit of history when we're going to talk about Mesopotamia in World War One. Excellent. Well, welcome back to the main section uh, of this kind of hybrid Wargamer historian uh, version of the podcast. And uh, we're going to have a chat now about the World War One campaign campaign in Mesopotamia, and and Nigel, as we said, he's, he's written a book about this, so um, he, he he should know a bit. So we, we should be all right. Um, uh, so I suppose, really, Mesopotamia. Then um, it's not a term that we tend to use today. So um, where where in the world is Mesopotamia? Let's start with an easy one. Well, it's um, it's modern day Iraq, isn't it? Uh, ancient Babylonia where ancient civilization began, the two um, huge rivers in the Tigris and the Euphrates, mm. um, a seat of learning. So some would argue that's where first written words were recording mm. on clay tablets. If you go to the British Museum, they have an incredible collection of mm. um, um, sculptures and, uh, and artifacts there that are, are well worth going to. Um, but for me, even though I was well, at the time was an historian of the First World, First World War even. Um, Mesopotamia came as a bit of a surprise to me. I was a member of um, a local history group that was writing the memoirs, memories of the chaps on our local war memorial. And a, a number of those had been killed out in Mesopotamia. And I thought, Mesopotamia, why are we there? What, what's <laughs> yeah, going on? Yeah. Where, where yeah. is Mesopotamia? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and why were we there? And um, so that's what spiked my interest. And during during that period, 2014 through to 2018, um, we also engaged with the local community. So we would give talks and presentations and exhibitions, which included the local uh, Indian community, uh, so mm. Sikhs, Hindus, and Muslims as well, um, and their experiences of the First World War. You know, and you mm. get some guys coming in with a you know, an Indian Medal of Merit or something of that order and, mm. and explain what their forefathers had done. But for me, it was the a number of the guys on our war memorial had died out in Mesopotamia and I wanted to know more about that. And mm. so when I started reading about it, I thought, well, this is absolutely amazing. It's totally <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> and I don't know anything about it and I want to. I sort of immersed myself in the um, historiography of the... Of, of of the Mesopotamian campaign, uh, so mm. I've got the official four volumes of the official history. Oh, uh, essential, essential yeah. reading they are. So from nineteen fourteen all the way through to nineteen eighteen, uh, and of course I am very very lucky to be on the doorstep of the Leicestershire and Rutland uh, archives, so I can mm. walk there uh, in about half an hour or so, and in the archives there's. Um, the, the collection of letters uh, from a chap called Donny Weir. And, and, mm. and they come in bundles. So there's about 20 wow. bundles of letters. And this guy wrote to his mum every single day of the war, just about. So Donny Weir was a, started off as a second lieutenant in Second Leicester's in, uh, on the Western Front and uh, mm. uh, su survived the war. He came back to the UK and ended up commanding a battalion of the West Yorkshires. But in his mm. letters, there's a description of him going shooting with the brigadier on the Tigris. <laughs> and then but there's also stuff about the individual battles that he was engaged mm. in. You know, Sheikh Sahad, the Wadi, a couple of battles of the Hanna, Deluja Redoubt, mm. um, and Stanley Yat, uh, all those battles where we're you know trying to relieve uh, Kut al Amara, where his towns end and uh, you know, thirteen thousand British and Indian Indian troops that need rescuing, really. Um, but it was it was these guys that had, you know, on my local war, war memorial that uh, initiated my interest in in Mesopotamia and why we were there. And um, and uh, because of that interest, and because the Second Leicester had, had gone out to fight in Mesopotamia, because I'd got all the resource on my doorstep, 
I just thought it would be the next natural project leading mm. on from my book on um, the eighth Lincolns at Luce, because we've got mm. the um, Leicestershire Regim Regimental Museum is in Leicester, which is, you know, not far from me either. And, um, and, and, and that's how, that's how my interest in Mesopotamia started. Yeah, I think, um, I think it'd be, I think that myself very similar to you, to you is that family connection that then led me to read into it. Um, so I would imagine that a lot of people listening to this are, are probably not that familiar at all um, with with the the conflict. Um, so we've set ourselves now. We're in what is modern day Iraq. So it's going to be oil, isn't it? That that's yes. why Britain is there. So yeah. just kind of sketch out what the situation's like before the war starts. Why are we there? Why are we defending this um, place? many thousands of miles from home? The straight answer to that is that the Royal Navy is converting from coal to oil. Mm. And so the British want a, a ready supply of oil. And uh, so when 6th Indian Division lands uh, in Mesopotamia, their uh, objectives are originally to protect the oil refineries, uh, the oil tanks and the pipelines, um, to protect any um area for uh, reinforcement reinforcements arriving and also to assure the local arabs that uh, they would support them against the turks because mm. the ottoman empire had occupied mesopotamia for the last 300 years or so right. i think yeah. and uh, so they they you know the arabs were a free people in the sense that they had you know uh, uh, you know they, they were part of the turkish ottoman empire so we went in there after a little fight, we secured uh, the oil refineries and the tanks and, and the pipelines. However, the whole campaign and strategy was run by the British Indian government in India. Mm, yeah. And there's something in, in what's called modern parlance, a massive mission drift. <laughs> yeah, because that, that initial landing, are we we down near Basra? That kind no, no, of it's, it's actually on the coast, Ken. So right, yeah. The, um, I can't recall are we the already, are, we, are we already creeped by the time we got you to have, Basra? You have, yes. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> so but we we uh, occupy Basra a little bit later and, um, mm. and, uh, and keep marching on. I think the British Indian government thought, hmm... Do you know what we could capture Baghdad? Yeah. What a, what a prize that would be the the mm. crown in the jewel in the you know in, in, in this sparse country desert um, that would be absolutely wonderful and uh, you should go ahead and do it, um, General Townsend. Is that is that drive is that drive coming from Townsend or is it coming from no. the British government? It's coming from the British government and right. his superior right. officers. I mean, Townsend yeah. writes to I think it's Nixon at the time. Um, so, you know, I'm going to attack, but it might, we might not be totally successful. And of course, by the time they get to Sassifon, they've got, you know, the supply line from Sassifon to the sea, I think is mm. 300 miles or so. And of course, at Sassifon, the Turks had brought reinforcements into the country. These were Gallipoli veterans. And um, whilst um, Townsend sort of won, I think it was a draw. Um, he had exhausted all of his forces in in, in winning the battle, mm. and so they were hounded all the way back to Kut Alamara, uh, where they were besieged. And um, but I mean, the, the, uh, I mean, when we think about Mesopotamia, you know, there's those biblical stories, but the place itself is amazing in that in the summer it's forty eight fifty degrees centigrade, yeah. and in the winter time you've got frost. So you've got those extremes, and then you, you'd have the Tigris in flood because the the meltwaters from the mountains to the east come across the plains and, and flood the Tigris. And you have the most amazing wildlife. So you've got flies in their billions, mosquitoes, yeah. and something called a sand fly, which mm. when it bit you, it's like being bitten by a, a scorpion or something. Apparently it was really <laughs> painful. And you could get fever from it. Yeah. People would, you know, men would die of sunstroke. The, 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 the water, water wasn't very good. There were literally no trees. The infrastructure, the, well, there wasn't an infrastructure except for the rivers. 
So people moved up and down the country on, on the river. And that's what the British army initially had to do as well. So uh, most of most of the book about the second lesson is that they arrive in December 1915, past Christmas Day in a, in a holding camp, and then they, they march up to the front. And then their first battle is at Sheikh Sahad, where they attack heavy losses. I think they took 300 casualties on, on, on their first attack. And we you know battalion is never going to be more than around about 900 men. That's mm. 30% casualties. Donny Weir, who I've mentioned, he won one of his DSOs at that battle. There were, I think, four non-commissioned officers giving um, a posthumous uh, commission. So they were killed in action, but then made up to lieutenants afterwards. Um, so that, that's a sort of, you know, if people are reacting in that way, you know, um, medals of distinction, you know, you know uh, promotions after the fact, I think that, mm. that, that gives a, an indication of the ferocity of fighting. And indeed, one of the things that I, I remember about this, this period, about the relief force trying to trying to get to uh, Townsend is that for the second Leicesters alone, there were 13 Distinguished Conduct Medals mm. awarded between the 6th of January and the 29th of February, 13. And a dis Distinguished Conduct Medal is almost akin to, almost akin to a Victoria Cross. So, you know, again, huge amounts of, of bravery in the face of adversity. Uh, there, a number of Indian soldiers won Victoria Crosses as well. There, and uh, you know, so so the, I think the important thing to remember is that seventy five percent of the troops that were fighting in Mesopotamia were, were mm. Indian. So it's Sikhs and uh, and Hindus, Gurkhas. The the army there, we've got the uh, it's the sixth Punar division, isn't it? The the That's initial the original one, one. Yes. Um, so is the overall operation commanded by? the British Indian Army, because as you say, if, if we look at brigade structures there, most of them have a British battalion and then it's two the battalions from, 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 from India. So it's being controlled by the British Indian Army rather than yeah. uh, the British Army is, is a better way. Because, it, it, you know, we, we're, we're talking about a forgotten front. I think mm. we, we both agree on that. Um, do you think that that lack of, or not lack of, but do you think that because it's mostly Indian troops, do you think that that could be something to do with why it wasn't particularly picked up at the time? It just seems to amazing to me, mm. you know. And you know, we're going to talk for for a while about this absolutely fascinating campaign. And yourself, myself, once we've actually got into it and started to read yeah. about it, it's like bloody hell, this is yeah. amazing, um, and it. It's kind of a, a lot of it, like you would say, you were saying, it's like boys' own stuff, really, isn't it? It's it like, is. You know, in the desert, yeah. on your own with a pistol, uh, that yeah. sort of kind of thing that we grew yeah. up on. Um, and it's always amazed me at, at why it's so forgotten or, or yeah. not not interested, not as interested. In... We, we touched on this a little bit earlier, Ken. I think that the focus of British history and of historians and historiography has been on the western front you know it's mm. on our doorstep we can pop across the channel and go and see the places where the action was fought mm. um in mesopotamia there, there was uh, one british brigade sorry one british battalion and three indian uh, battalions per brigade the uh, indian brigades would, uh, or soldiers would be commanded by uh, british officers so for the ordinary ranks, then if they were writing memoirs or letters home, that would be in their native tongue. So that might be a reason as to why we don't really hear the voices of the Indian troops. Although I know there has been a couple of volumes of uh, of letters translated into English. It, um, it seems to it seems to be turning, doesn't it? And we seem to be mm. we seem to be coming out of that. British only viewpoint. And I know my friend Stephen Barker, who's been on the show, yes. uh, has written about Hardik Singh Malika, the yeah. uh, Sikh pilot in World War One. Um, and I know he's interested in the you know in the Indian Army. And I mm. think it will uh, continue. I think we've started it now, haven't we? We've we've, we've popped the cork, um, and I think it's going to be interesting. And I hope we do get a flood of histories and and um, reminiscences based upon 
Indian memories of, of, of those particular battles. I think that would yeah. be uh, extremely yeah. useful. We talked a little bit about because I'm just trying to kind of set the scene. We've talked about the British Army and it, and how it's British Indian. Um, the the Turkish Army as well is um, it, it's got Arab people in the service as well as Turkish. Yeah troops as yeah. well so that's quite a, a mixed force yeah. uh, of troops as well isn't it it is so there were turkish soldiers and uh arab irregulars the turkish soldiers were completely misjudged by people like kitchener i mean the turkish nation had been at war with the greeks i think it was 1912 1913 and had lost lost that war um so i think you know the sort of higher command so the the, 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 uh, the Turks aren't up to much. However, we <laughs> we found out very quickly when we landed in Gallipoli that that, was, that wasn't the case. Uh, they were tenacious. Um, Ger the, the, um, the Turks did have German advisors. Um, mm. So there was a field marshal called Glotz um, that was advising them. And um, uh, von Lindman, uh, his book, Five Years in Turkey is quite interesting. There were actually German combat troops as well in in Mesopotamia as well, um, but the the interesting thing is that Turkish troops said you know there were veterans from Gallipoli fighting there, and uh, they you know when we look at the land that the British were to assault, on mm. one flank you have um, the Tigris River, yeah, and on the other flank you have this deep marsh that's completely impassable, impassable. And then in front of you, you have a series of trench systems in which you have to attack. Now, the, the, the land is completely flat. The, you have mirage as well to take take into effect. And um, the the um, Turkish Turkish infantry are very, very good. You know, if they've got mm. good officers behind them, they're, they're, they, as we can see from the battles that took place, that the, their resistance stiffens. So Sheikh Sahad, they re withdrew at the Battle of the Wadi. They withdrew, but thereafter they were pretty much very tenacious. One of the difficulties of fighting there is bridging equipment across the across mm. the Tigris. So when the river's in flood, you, when you're reading the official history or the regimental histories, you know the the, the, the bridges get washed away. So that. Yeah opportunity of movement onto the left or right hand side of the bank was, was limited so m most of the most of the actions take place on the left bank of the tigris heading up mm. towards towards cut of course townsend would have ordered not to try and break out he had to stay where he was which you know in hindsight with the benefit of hindsight it's absolutely fabulous isn't it but they they may have been able to break out and helped um, the British attacking towards if they were attacking um, from from behind. But um, by and large, the Turkish infantry were very, very tenacious. There was a period, there was a battle called, uh, I hope this is sort of pronounced right, Beit Issa, uh, where the, the, um, the Turks you that one first. <laughs> 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 the, the, the Turks counterattacked, and that really was the end of the relief effort. Because yeah. you know the, the British forces there just bolted. Mm. They I mean, they really did just abandon the trenches and abandon the guns, and uh, it, it was a very very difficult day for them. Because there has been there has been some I've I've picked I haven't read them yet, and I do apologise to people. Um, but uh, uh, there's some Turkish authored um, books on the. I do. I haven't got them with me, so I can't give you the names at the moment. Um, but uh, that's it. Because I wonder. I wonder from a Turkish perspective, is if their historians have, have concentrated on Gallipoli as as kind of their Western Front, mm -hmm. if you like, with it being yeah. so close to home. I don't know whether the the Mesopotamia campaign for them, with it being further away, whether they've not concentrated on it too much. But they ha I have seen recently turkish authored books on the on mm. the subject um so if there is anyone turkish listening i'd love to hear from you um uh, and see whether that is the the, the slant where the gallipoli takes the the limelight if you like i i think that the turks are interested in all aspects of the first world war history actually mm. i mean i had the privilege of being able to make friends with a, a turkish historian 
uh, Tunsay Yilmazza, who helped me mm. translate from Turkish, oh, fantastic. Turkish memoirs in, into mm. English. And uh, he's mentioned, or the work that he helped me translate is, is actually used in my book uh, uh, on the uh, chapter in Mesopotamia. So uh, the, 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 you can get hold of um, um, s- s- some English language work mm. from from uh, Turkish historians. I've also got a copy of the Turkish official history in Turkish. Wow. Um, so um, the trench maps that are in the back of that are really very interesting. They're much more detailed than the maps that we get in our official history, which at one point led me to believe that perhaps we didn't have any trench maps. And I think at the beginning we didn't. But towards the end of the war uh, in Mesopotamia, we did. We had quite detailed maps. But at the beginning, we did, hardly had anything to fight with other than rifle and bayonet. We were short of very light. We were short of barbed wire. We were short of uh, Lewis guns. We were short of artillery and ammunition in every shape or form. We were short of aircraft. And the aircraft that we did have broke down because of the, the conditions, you know, you know, 50 degrees centigrade in these sort of paper kites that they were flying. Yeah, because we had Martingdales, didn't we, to, out there? Um, <laughs> and when I, when I, I'd never, you know, again, I, I consider myself reasonably up on history and military equipment. I had to look up what a Martingdale was. I'd never heard of it. Do you want uh, to explain to the audience what that is, Ken? It's just a piece of shite. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it took off. I've got no idea. It's kind of no. like a, it's um, from that kind of naive initial phase of the Air Force where, you yeah. know, we've, we've got pushers and um, yeah. B2Cs and that sort of thing. Where would if it takes off, that's yeah. it. We're happy with that. Yeah. Health, health and safety check. It takes off. Tick. Yeah. No, no bits at the bottom <laughs> about safely landed or anything like yeah. that. Will, will it come back? No idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, just ease off. I mean, we, we were short of everything. And um, I mean, w- one of the things that sticks out for me is the disaster around medical support for wounded and injured soldiers. I mean, during the war, there was a a Mesopotamia commission, commissioned by Parliament, um, that reported much to Willie Robinson's chagrin about the absolute negation of any responsibility to try and help, you know, the wounded. I mean, the agony that those men must have gone through. Mm -hmm. Uh, There there just weren't simply enough medical personnel there. They would have medical uh, injuries on on, on an ox-drawn cart with no springs across rough ground, where there was Mm -hmm. reported that men would actually throw themselves off the cart because it was so painful. And then when they got to the river, the barges that took them to the river, the men were left completely to themselves. So they were just covered completely in shite, basically. Yeah. Because they couldn't yeah. go to the toilet, so they went to the toilet where they lay. And, they, you know, there were two hospitals in the entire country for British casualties. It absolutely wasn't good enough. And, and uh, those poor men that were, that were wounded pretty much was a death sentence, where elsewhere, where we had a you know pretty good evacuation system on the Western Front pales mm. into ex- insignificance uh, in at Mesopotamia. Um, you know, the, the, the high command m- medics in high, military medics in high command were named and shamed in that. And um, rightly so. Absolutely. Rightly so. It was uh, uh, it, very, it, very badly done. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite frightening, really, that when you look at the at the casualties and it, I've got I've just got, I've got them down here we we've got 11,000 killed during the campaign but 5,281 died of wounds and that's yeah. the 50% of 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 that and then you've got um huge amount of wounded but then you've got 70 nearly 17,000 people died of disease yeah um and as you were saying earlier on you've got the you've got the flies you've got this um extremely limited supply line haven't you you've got yeah basically you've got the river yes um did we ever get around to building railways i can't remember yes we did yes so that's with maud everything changes 
but just yeah, just yeah. just on that i mean the, the, there was there was no infrastructure in in uh, in mesopotamia really so we did build roads and 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 railways when mud comes on uh to be, to, to to take command uh, everything changes mm. but um you know he men died of heat stroke they had to wear their sun helmets and they had like a a, a sun vest a, a spine pad it was called and they thought that would protect them from sunstroke it didn't they died mm. you know they were like a thousand men a week being shipped out from mesopotamia in the middle of the summer back to india but through through illness from effects of the sun and um, mm. mesopotamia still had the plague um you could die wow. of the plague in mesopotamia you know you, 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 it was just incredible i i don't think you can get across what an absolutely horrid place it was to fight i mean bad enough people shooting at you but you've got the weather you've got the conditions you've got poor food poor sanitation poor water uh poor medical support um you know i i i do you know if i'd been a kitchener volunteer i volunteered to go and fight the kaiser and end up in mesopotamia i would be very upset i mean for me no. i don't like creepy crawly things can i don't know about you no. um <laughs> but you know i i mean when men were eating their bully beef they were surrounded by myriads of flies they had these special hoods that they used to try and put over their food and uh, and eat it and it's mm. like how it's absolutely incredible how do you maintain a fit and effective fighting force when you're fighting nature as well it's incredible it's absolutely fascinating i don't know whether if you if you've come across this but i i was just thinking then of tommy in the western front um he's in a trench he's wet he's cold um and he gets his papers and it says right battalions off to mesopotamia um, <laughs> did they think yes hot no. sunshine playing in the sand no i mean they, they would have known about it from their biblical studies as children yeah you know, ezra's tomb and babylonia and stuff like that mm. but i mean the, the the i mean second lesters had been serving out in in india so they would have mm. experienced the hot weather um and then obviously they were brought over to the western front fought on the western front through 1915 and then over to mesopotamia I think Mesopotamia is a whole new ball game in terms of weather. I mean, there was no firewood. If there was any wood, they used it for cooking, but they couldn't never build use it for shelters, you know. And you know, tents really weren't protection uh, for them. And when you read about the oh, it, there was one ice making machine in Basra, like, <laughs> and ba Basra was as a port for the distribution of arms and ammunition and all the equipment just everything just sunk into into the mud along the river so they mm -hmm. they, they, they had to bring in specialist civilian engineers to re-engineer that ba basra harbor you see you know the, 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 there's um the evidence is that all the stores were laid out along the banks of the river you know poured with rain it was all degraded the the, the, the quickest mode of transport were these like little flat bottom boats to get up to up to the front otherwise it, it it was marching and what you don't want to be doing is marching in yeah, thunder yeah. and lightning and pouring rain i mean when you took when, when you listen to the guys you know writing about the weather it's torrential rain like they'd never mm. seen before in their life thunderstorms and lightning like they'd never seen before and they're fighting in this or trying to and of course the sand turns into a quagmire so they're in mud up to their knees and they're trying to advance across this and then johnny turk's going thank you very much pop another one gone um it was just incredible this i i don't think there was another area like it for fighting actually you would have thought with the experience that the british had had of empire mm. um for probably nearly a, what 60 70 years or a, a longer of working in hot weather that we would have had some kind of a steer on how things were going to go and yeah. it just seems that you know as, as you've alluded to there when i've done my read and i'm kind of thinking how were we so unprepared mm -hmm. or or is it or is it that mission creep that's caused it because we're not unprepared we've just gone in thinking 
we'll grab the oil fields, leave it at that, and then somebody's gone, well, actually, can you see that mm. that dot on the map up there, Baghdad, yeah. should we go and have a go at that? Yeah. And, um, I mean, I think halfway through the campaign, Sir William Robinson takes over. So mm. the tr 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 strategic and decisions were then taken over by the British Army in, in London, uh, uh, in England. So what's his what's his name? Uh, Duffy and um, Duff rather, and the others in India have to take a back seat. Where Sir William Robinson then comes to the fore and is like, "Enough of this. This is how it's going to be." But you know, they assemble quick, quickly assemble a relief force to try and rescue Charles Townsend. And you know, I, I, as you've alluded to already, uh, Ken, we suffer more casualties in attempting to relieve him mm -hmm. than actual the number of uh, men. Uh, captured. So there was 19,000 captures and what was it? 23,000 casualties um, mm. to, to try and for that not to happen. But Kitchener was very concerned about, you know, the prestige of the British Empire, if, mm. if, if a British capture were, 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 were to be had. And in, in, indeed it was. And uh, so the relief force was there to, you know, to try as best as they could to, to attend to that. But um, you know the the, the the commanders there, you know, not really the best. Um, although for the Battle of the Duluja Redoubt, that, that mm. was an amazing action where they marched across the desert by night, which a, a huge flanking movement, and came to this this redoubt. All the Turks were asleep, but the commander <laughs> in charge, all the all the junior British officers wanted to attack it without any without a barrage but the commander in charge thought then no, that's too dangerous if we attack the turks will see us and we'll get mown down so they opened up the barrage woke the turks up and they mowed us down as we attacked so you yeah. know but it was an inc i mean i think that's an incredible idea it just didn't work and again so those men that had marched overnight ended up back in the very positions in which they'd left some three days later, yeah. I think, uh... I, think it, I think it's I think it's important to point out to people who are not familiar with the campaign and maybe more familiar with the Western Front is those opportunities of, of flank mm. um, and cavalry paid quite an important role. Um, one of my favourite books is from the, from the, the history of the British cavalry um, in, in throughout history, and there's a special one. There's one volume that just covers mesopotamia um yeah. and you you realize how important cavalry are whereas in the western front there is there, there is no flank until no. you go into switzerland yeah um and that that makes that makes a difference doesn't it to way how the battles are fought and as you say these night marches to try and get round flanks are, are a big part of the uh, of the of the campaigns well although, although i mean having said that ken i mean i think the cavalry in the period leading up to Charles Townsend and his men surrendering on the 29th of April, mm. their movement was very much determined by the river because obviously the, yes. war, the horses have to be watered. Supplies and water, yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at one of the final actions of the Leicesters in Mesopotamia, they have 500 Ford vans just full of mm. water for the men in the cavalry. So, they, you know, uh, it's incredible. And that they have armoured cars, which they, they didn't have. When the that was the force. next thing I was going yeah. to talk about, yeah. Yeah. So once Maud comes on board, everything changes. There's a period of quiet, but then there's a mm. huge period of reorganisation, men being trained properly, men, mm. you know, they become fitter, healthier, more, better diet. The railways are started. Um, the logistics are improved. Maud was very, very... Uh, he was a guy that was always on your shoulder, making sure that yeah. you'd done the job right. You know, some of the more that his officers immediately underneath him, uh, I think something that they got a little bit irritated that it was, oh, but what about that and what about this? But he was meticulous in planning. Sometimes you need that style of Absolutely. leader, don't you? Um, it's all right. It's all right leading the cavalry charge from the front. Yeah. But if your horses haven't got any fodder or water. Yes. It, it's a futile gesture, isn't it? Yeah. So when when you look at the advance to recapture Kut, the British army is actually advanced, or British Anglo army, Indian in, Indian troops as well, of course, 
are advancing on both sides of the River Tigris, not just one. And the Saniat trenches, which were described as the trenches from hell, because it was like <laughs> seven trench lines, were finally, finally uh, captured. And once that had happened, then the British on the left uh, bank of the Tigris could advance up, up to Kut. And uh, that was that was captured in in February uh, 1917. And then on the 11th of March 1917, they captured Baghdad. And so after the after the um, capture of, of Kut, the campaign turns into one of pursuit, actually. And uh, with, with with the Turks just pulling away in the nick of time because mm. what they were looking for i think was uh you know a, a annihilation yeah. if, if at all possible so you've got you know cut cut alamar is captured a capture of baghdad i mean the evidence you know some of the british officers that went there and had a look at that they weren't very impressed i think that the mosques and the minarets were were beautiful um but the rest of the city was falling down and and mm. uh but uh, interestingly, the second Leicesters, uh, they were billeted near Baghdad railway station. One, oh, of the right, things, yeah. one of the things Germans had done before the war is they had, had started a Berlin to Baghdad railway. Yeah, so they, they had yeah, yeah. aspirations of influencing that period of the, or, or that part of the world. So at Baghdad railway station, there's um, the second Leicesters are billeted there and they in second less in the Leicestershire regiments museum, is the German bell that had been presented <laughs> to Baghdad railway station in 1913, yeah. I think it is. It's, wow. it's behind a, a glass case. And I had the privilege of actually um, going in on my own with the curator and he was able to take the glass doors open. And so I could get some oh, like, wow. proper photographs of the, of, yeah. of, of the bell itself. So that, that's interesting yeah superb um so i just think for 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 the we've we've talked around about the various uh battles and, and stuff so i just think for those not familiar with the with the campaign um it will just kind of um go through it in chronological order then so um just we, we've we've got those initial landings um and then we we kind of Basra, and yeah. uh, we I I fought a battle at Basra. I mean, it was it. I think it's considered to be or believed to be the site of the Garden of Eden. That um, area, yes, things, yeah, yeah. That, that is one of the things I've read. So, we, we, like we, we alluded to at the start, we're in real sort of biblical history area, aren't we? And then we as are. we go towards Baghdad, we've got Babylon up in that sort of area as well. Yeah. Um, so we 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 have that initial drive, don't we? Um, with um townsend and um, we have a series of battles and if you go on to the yorkshire gamer blog site you'll see that i fought each of those battles individually on the way up to uh now pronunciation test test upon sessifon sessi yeah there we go there we yeah. go well i knew you'd know nice um so um th that is very close to baghdad isn't it it's, it is 20 it's miles that far. yeah it's no. really so we kind of we kind of did that so if you're looking at this from a wargaming point of view you've got all those individual battles up to Sestaphon you can fight that battle and then it's supplies isn't it Nigel that's why we mm. end up going backwards yeah. um and there's a real there's a really interesting battle that I can't remember the name of now um where the British camp on the way back to cut um and they're they're attacked as they're waking up in the morning and these steamboats on the side of the road uh river um sort of firing up to get going for the yeah. next morning and it's quite an interesting yeah. interesting action um and then we fall back to cut itself so i'd i'd like to talk a little bit about the siege if if you don't mind sure just so everyone's got it in the mind we've pushed on we've run out of, um we've run out of supplies we've come back and we've gone into this ancient town there's an old fort there and it's kind of surrounded by a river so it's it's a fairly decent place to hold up but was it was the plan do you think Nigel was the plan to stay there and regroup or what were we were what were we trying to do at court the plan was there to stay there and be relieved yeah. um 
So Kut Alamara was about, it's a significant place. I think there were 7,000 people living there. Mm. And one of the interesting things is that Townsend decided to let the Arab population stay. So he had to feed them as well, or they had to be fed. One of the frustrating things about Townsend is that he never really did a proper audit of how much food he'd got in the town itself. And that led to hurried uh, attempt to re to relieve him. Plus, of course, they w as I've said, they wouldn't allow him to break out either. Mm. So I think they were, they were worried about the prestige of if they left the guns behind, if they left the wounded behind, you know, what what the Arab world in, would make about that. Kitchener was certainly concerned about it. But his instructions were to absolutely stay put and wait mm. for the relief force. So yeah. whilst um, Kitchener is, is at Kut, sorry, um, Townsend is at uh, Kut Alamara, the relieving force is 20 miles or so away further down the river because Kut's on the river. But you have all of the Turks in between Kut Alamara and um, Sheikh Sahad is the, the first action we have. And so T Townsend is conserving uh, his food as best as he can. Um, but the Turks lay siege to Kut Alamara. So they have um, trench lines all, all, all around it. The, the town backs onto, uh, on, onto the Tigris itself. Um, so it's possible that they could have slipped away via the river. It's possible that they could ha have um, fought their way out or attempted to fight their way out, but mm -hmm. he wasn't allowed to do that. I mean, there's a number of occasions where um, Townsend requests to to help because mm -hmm. you know, he could hear in the distance sometimes, you know, the gunfire and the fighting, and they were using yeah. telegraph as the siege progressed and as rations were were cut the royal flying corps did the first airdrop of all wow. to try and yeah. drop supplies in, in into cut itself but uh, i mean you may may have seen those photographs of those emaciated troops uh, and, and because of the strong religious belief of some of the indian soldiers they wouldn't eat meat or sort certain meats and uh, so pretty much they were living living on chapatis i think uh something yeah well I, I can't i can't remember which book it was in, uh, in um but i read quite a fascinating chapter on that um difficulty of supply yes where you have different religious requirements with mm. different troops uh, and i, I kind of remember I can't remember the exact quote, but somebody was sort of saying the Muslims would eat this, the Sikhs would eat mm. this, and the Hindus would eat this. And then somebody yeah. said, well, what about the British soldiers? And they, the guy said, they'll just we eat whatever this bloody yeah. left. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but we, you know, we, I hadn't thought about that as a, as an issue. Um, and clear, you know, that's quite a comp supply in general, mm. you know, getting, 2000 calories or a thousand or whatever to johnny blogs yeah is a difficult thing as we've already spoke about but then to get a specific one for 500 calories to him and a 500 calories to him and five that's that that's multiplying the difficulty yeah. of the logistics isn't it yeah i mean they're, they're, very they're, very difficult i mean they ended up killing all the mules and the officers horses as well so uh they were really down to it was a, a last gasp actually you know that townsend did extend the amount of time that he thought he could hold out once mm. he'd done an audit in the sort of the, the middle of the siege he conducted a further audit and found some more grain uh, so but the 20, 29th of um, april was the absolutely the last day in which they mm. they could um, they could um, withstand uh, starvation really was setting in people were dying from illnesses which really they shouldn't have died from so there was, there was a last gasp effort from the royal navy where they took a, a paddle steamer loaded with i think like 250 tons mm. sorry yeah 250 tons of of supplies but the, ti the tigris was it's very shallow and the turks would have steel ropes across it and they they um they fouled on one of these uh, on one of these steel ropes, and the the uh, the tug was um, was captured, and the British officers were executed. 
and they were both awarded the Victoria Cross for their bravery. But that was the that was the absolutely the last action in trying to save Townsend, and mm. um, they inter- entered into negotiations with the Turks. So Lawrence of Arabia was in- involved in that mm. as well. Kitchener tried to bribe the, t- the the Turks. First of all, he offered them a million pounds, and they which they rejected. And then they he offered them two million pounds, which they rejected. They wanted the victory. They didn't want the money. It, I mean, the prestige of defeating the British army and forcing them to capture and to be taken in as prisoners of war was was immense. And I, I think um, the Turkish commander, you know, called his men, you know, lion hearts. It was this proclamation mm. after after the after the uh, surrender about you know ha- how determined they had been mm. and and uh, what a great victory it, it was for them, uh, which it was, you know. So we. Sorry, we've got this. We've had then this. This we've talk, we talked about and we named the battles earlier on. This this drive to relief cut and again, there's a series of battles there. A series of the ones that I've fought um, and I'm up to the the Battle of the Wadi is the next battle that we're going to fight. Um, how close did they get to relieving cut? So they were at Saniat, the trenches of hell, um, which. Uh, if memory serves me correctly, it's about eight miles from Kut I think. So close. I it? know, so close. So but the, close. this trench system was very, very complex, supported by artillery. And uh, as I've said, you've got the Tigris on one flank, which you can't, uh, you can't use that area. You can't mm. outflank them because you've got river. Um, and then on the other, on the other flank, you've got this impassable marsh. I mean, there were mm. a number of attempts to see if men uh, or artillery pieces could get through the marsh but they just it was just impossible yeah. so yeah. it was frontal attack i mean during this period the 13th division which was an all british division of which maud had commanded at gallipoli arrived and their first action they did very well but it soon petered out just uh, it was too much it was you know a frontal assault for a, for a frontal assault to work very well, you have to destroy the trenches. Mm. But the trenches cannot be seen because the land is flat. You have mirage. Mm. Our we, we have no observer. We can see where the fall of shot is landing, but we don't know whether that hit the trench or not. Uh, and then, of course, there, there was aerial battles over the battlefield and. Um, you know, when you look at the British official history and the maps that they have there, it does really just seem to me that at that point in time, in 1916, we didn't really know specifically mm. where the German, where, sorry, where the Turkish trenches were. And in fact, one of the one of the officers from the Second Leicesters uh, actually writes in in his report, "We do not know where the Turkish trenches are." So it's only when you fall upon them do you do you know where they are. But the Turks, on the other hand, have put sticks out and ranges mm. so they could adjust their rifle fire as as the men advanced across the flat and open ground. Yeah, extremely, extremely dangerous yes. with the, that total lack of cover. And is that when the the second lasters? Is that do they are they part of that relief force? They are. Yes. They're, yeah. Yeah. So they are involved um, in half a dozen actions. Mm. Um, to get to to get to uh, to Townsend uh, and you know take 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 heavy casualties. I mean, Sheikh Sahad is three hundred casualties, um, more casualties at the Wadi, more casualties at um, Hanna, the do 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 Jailer Redoubt again, Saniat. They're all in, they're involved in all of those, and because of, because of the time pressure, you know mm. the, the, they're in relief a little bit, but by and large they're in action. Um, in all of those major significant offensives, yeah, like you say, there's that drive, isn't there? Because they've got to get to cut within a certain amount of time, so there's no hanging around, and um, you've got to push on to the next position and get through that, and, and so on and so on. And then, sadly, obviously, the the um, the people at cut they all march off into. Prisoners of war, don't they? Yes, and that's a very, those, those very, who have survived. A very well. I was going to say sad, but it's not. It's horrifying. Yeah. You know, people marched to their death. Just terrible. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that's a very bad period of history as well for mm. th those those men captured. Indian soldiers died from starvation, forced route marches in the blazing sun into the middle of nowhere, really through deserts. Um, yeah. When your when your your health is already degraded, it doesn't take much for you to actually to fall all, all along the wayside. And the Arab irregulars were totally brutal, you know, kicking and uh, and beating with, with 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 sticks and and so on and so forth. It's a wonder that any of them survived. Mm. It's um, it's kind of a death march, isn't it? It is a death um, march. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So it's um, and then again, just leading people uh, through um, the course, we then have that pause, don't we? After the attempts at siege, uh, relieving the siege, and the siege is over. Um, and I think that's, is it kind of April, May 16 when that ends? Um, yes. And then there's a pause, isn't there? So right at the end of 16, start of 17. Yes. When, when Maud is in command. Yeah. Uh, and I think you've explained to us early on, didn't you, how he reorganized, reinvigorated, retrained, resupplied, yeah. um, ready to go um, on a kind of a second drive. Yeah. Um, or up to cut, up to cut. Um, it seems to me that from from that point onward that the the Turkish troops are are on the back foot. Um, are they not getting the um, reinforcements and no, resupplies that Maud's getting? No. Yeah. That, in fact, the British high, sorry the Turkish high command had taken some troops away to to, to another theatre of war, so they had mm. actually denuded uh, their forces in that uh, along the Tigris. And so that's why it was easier as well, um, in a way, to, 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 to win the actions that we did. I mean, they were still very tenacious and still a very hard enemy uh, to fight, uh, very competent. But because of the, the volume of forces that they'd had sent away to another theatre of war in the, in the Caucasus, I believe it was, that, um, you know, they, they, they just simply didn't have the manpower to withstand you know, there is now strong British forces, now properly organised, fed and led. And, um, you know, it's all it's about, you know, Maud having, a, I think, an excellent understanding of the field service regulations that, you know, helps British officers to you know, plan out attacks. And, and um, Maud regains the initiative. Yeah, so, so that's the important thing, so isn't it? After we've actually captured or recaptured Kut Alamara, it is a, it is is now a campaign of pursuit, and mm. uh, so Baghdad is captured, and then after that, the Second Leicester, for example, are fighting along what was part of the Berlin uh, Baghdad Railway. So there's mm. an action at a place called Istanbulat where a Captain Diggins um, captures a Turkish battery with him and about mm. half a dozen other men. Unfortunately, he can't keep hold of it. Um, because Turks counterattack, and the Turks are very good at counterattack. Um, but Diggins, thankfully, um, go, uh, it survives to the end of the war. Uh, so he's still there in 1918, 1919. And then the, the, the final action for the Lessers is a place called uh, Tikrit, which is where Saladin was supposed to have been born, mm -hmm. but where yeah, yeah. Saddam Hussein was definitely born. He um, was, yes. <laughs> And uh, so that's that was their last action. But then the second Leicesters were withdrawn from Mesopotamia to go and fight in in Palestine. And so they were. So that, yeah, it kind of fizzles out, doesn't it? After that, after Baghdad, because it a does, lot yeah. of troops go on to that Palestine yeah. um, Battle of Megiddo, all that sort of yes. stuff. And the um, the Mesopotamia area is just kind of consolidated, isn't it? And then um, there's a there's an armistice and a uh, is it I've got it, the armistice of Mudros kind of brings it all to all to yeah. a close. Um, I'm sure we could talk about Palestine and, and uh, on another, another day. day. Yes, uh, <laughs> but um, so you know, I'm just looking at it now from a from a gaming point of view. There are some some periods, you know, I've just done the Risorgimento Battle of Mentana. There's only one battle and a couple of skirmishes in that period uh, so it's quite limited in terms of scenarios etc but this mesopotamia campaign there must be 20 25 yeah battles yeah um 
all of which are gameable, all of which are reasonably well, you know, you can, if you know the right places to look, you can, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, um, you, you can find out information. Um, so, um, as people, regular listeners know, I use If the Lord Spares Us from Nick Skinner and the Two Fat Lardies as a, as a rule set, and I've played with a couple of thousand figures, big actions, and I think Pendra can do 10 mil figures for the period as well. So for, for a war game, of the, um, you've got so many different things, haven't you, compared to the Western Front? Yeah. We talked about the cavalry. We talked about um, the the armoured cars. Well, we didn't really yeah. cover that, did we, in, no. in a lot of detail? So there's an armoured car squadron that's got um, armoured cars, and they've got the, the Fords with the machine guns on the yeah. back as well and that's very in, in, in innovative isn't it yeah. i mean i know they've they, they, they taken cars to gallipoli and then stuck them in a trench because they couldn't really go anywhere um but uh, in in mesopotamia armored cars and mobile warfare comes into its own doesn't yeah, it yeah it does there's another battle um because it's a something like the deer bend where it's actually out we we are pushing barges across the river to assault the other river bank so that yes. that that would be an amazing thing to try and attempt as a as a wargaming scenario is you know assaulting the enemy across the river um so artillery men in barges getting the barge across then trying to get a pontoon bridge across as quickly as possible um you know vc actions ensue um yeah really interesting stuff I mean, some of the some of the really really good game. I mean, we we had a game one when we first started the period where some Gurkhas jumped off a gunboat and charged a Turkish trench line, and it's like don't get any better than this. No, this is this is proper boys' own stuff. Yeah, and and we did the um, the Turkish attack on the uh, the fort at um, Kut when the the the, yeah. uh, the German advisor who said don't attack went off for christmas and yeah. the turkish went he's booking off now let's go yeah. and go. Yeah. um both extremely close and interesting interesting things to, to fight so um we've kind of whetted everyone's appetite uh nigel we, um so what kind of what would be your recommended obviously obviously your book that goes without saying um but uh what would be your kind of go-to books if you were somebody interested in history like a lot of people who listen to this podcast but maybe don't know anything about it where would you go what would be your books that you would suggest to people in my view the best book is by a chap called charles townsend exactly the same spelling as the the general in cut it's called when god made hell <laughs> and it's yeah. part of a an arab proverb so when god made hell he made mesopotamia but added flies <laughs> so but that book is it's one of the best research books that i've read it's beautifully written you i mean it's a it's a good size book but you just breeze through it it's it, it, it that would be my uh, recommendation is uh, charles townsend when when god made hell uh that, that that's really very really good and and the other the other of course is the the official history um, so they were they were reprinted by the Imperial War Museum, if I remember rightly, yeah. not that long ago. Um, and you can you can pick them up. I think I think uh, I, I, you will again alluded to this earlier on. I think the disappointing thing about that is the quality of the maps. Mm. You know, some of them are literally a block Turkish and then an arrow and a block British and maybe like a squiggle for the tigris on one side they're quite poor um but in terms of information obviously the um a bit like my quiz they're slightly biased towards um the british <laughs> no surprise um <clears throat> but well worth well worth a read well worth a read yes. um for an overall and I, what i do is um when i'm refighting a battle um i will use those as my primary source to yeah. get you know yeah. an idea of, of the of the troops involved and, and, yeah. the, and the battle etc um so they the have found those actually because they're god when were they done 1920s mm -hmm. well some yeah. of them are still being written when the first world war started yeah so yeah, the so, second world war started yeah yeah <laughs> yes yeah 
Um, so yeah, that would that would have been a, a good book if it was written. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so some of them are available on uh, free DP PDF because they're out of copyright. Yeah, um, and you can get hard copies from naval and military. Uh, as yeah. you say, you can get them um, on PDFs. Your local library or your local archive might might have hard copy. Uh, Leicester University has those like, special collections, and they've got uh, a good number of the um, official histories with the maps that you can pull out in oh. their full glory. Um, pull out map, I love yes. one of them. Yes, That's with, with the pockets book, in the back. And, oh, um, yes. dear. Now I'm getting excited, <laughs> Nigel. Now I'm getting excited. <laughs> Um, well, it's um, it's been a brilliant trip um, along Mesopotamia, um, and I'll, I'd like to thank you, Nigel, for coming on today and um, sharing your expertise with us. It's been a, a lovely journey, and, and something I'm interested in, and I've learned a lot today. And I hope that the the people listening um, realise, you know, they might not have heard of the, the Mesopotamia campaign. It is a yeah. fantastic one to it is research, indeed. as you have done, Nigel, and, and game as I have done. So um, yeah. I hope we've. Um, we've expanded that little bit of history uh, for people today. Um, just before we go, people, uh, I always give people an opportunity to ask me a question. Have I escaped, Nigel, or have you got one? Oh, he's looking, you might have written this bit down. Uh, no, I haven't written <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to ask you, do you think that AI has any room in wargaming, artificial intelligence? No, it's an interesting point. It, it, and, um, it's something I th we thought about. I well, I thought about a long time ago um, when computer gaming first started, and I kind of thought, "Oh, um, are we going to get to a point where we can recreate war gaming on the screen? And would we then bother with toy soldiers and stuff?" And um, I think that moment's been and gone. In that, you know, you look at Rome Total War, for example, the computer yeah. program that is wargaming on a screen isn't it and there are so many versions of different periods and stuff now but it's still that figures that, that draw me back so artificial intelligence has always been there as an opponent hasn't it on, yeah. on wargaming so it will be interesting to see if we ever get to the point where you can buy a program or whatever and fight an artificial intelligence opponent yeah. on the war games table that would be interesting like in a chess game uh, yeah and I, I think it, I think it does have a point, and I, and I think you know, wargaming can be a solitary hobby. You know, lots of people have contacted me and, and have said, you know, um, quite often I'll be sat there on my own, and and you know, the the voices of you and your, your guests are kind of like friends talking about wargaming in the room, and that, that's a really nice sentiment yeah. to be fair. And you know, if you haven't got a, a regular wargaming partner, um, if you live out in the middle of nowhere or you just might not be um, that keen on, on social interaction, that AI wargaming opponent could be could be an interesting one, couldn't it? Mm, yeah, mm, it could. Yeah. The future. Oh, that's a good question. I like, I, yeah, like garlic bread was. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's been brilliant talking to you today, Nigel. Thanks uh, for doing this show. I really you, enjoyed Ken. myself today. Um, so it just leaves us to say goodnight to the audience. Good night. Thank you very much, Ken. Take care. Good night, everyone. Thanks very much. There we go. I hope you enjoyed that episode there with Nigel Atta. And um, I hope it's inspired you to have a look at World War One Mesopotamia. And as I say, it's one of my favourite wargaming uh, periods. Um, it just had so many different aspects to a World War One game with the armoured cars and the desert, etc., and the gunboats and the river. So it's one to look at. It's a fascinating period of history as well. If it's not something you've read at, up on, it was something that passed me by when I was younger, and it was only, as I said on the show, finding out about a relative who is buried in, in the Baghdad Cemetery uh, that got me 
researching and looking at the period. So hopefully some of you will tune into uh, World War One Mesopotamia and uh, hopefully we'll see some more games out there in the future. Lovely speaking to Nigel and thank you Nigel for coming on the show and uh, making it such a, a smooth experience. I'm much appreciated mate. So next episode, booked in, recording on Monday, I'm going to be speaking to um, the authors of Rapid Fire, and that's uh, Richard Marsh and uh, Colin Rumford. Now, they've just recently appeared on WSS podcast, would you believe? Um, and I thought they were a news podcast, and I was the big game old school podcast, but there we go. Anyway, Colin and Richard are going to get the full Yorkshire game of treatment, uh, not just the 20 minute WSS treatment next week so uh hope you look forward to that one and join me again very soon thanks again once for listening for listening if you could leave likes and reviews and give us a follow wherever you can it's all free um and any further exposure that this podcast can get through your likes and follows and reviews i'm very grateful for until next time have some great wargaming and i'll see you soon see you later.